Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we're going to do a part two. Like I said, this poem for Bible Manhunt, this poem is a really long poem and there's a lot of stuff to get out of it for instruction in righteousness. And remember, the whole point of these series is as you find a book or you have somebody that you see online that they'll say something, I'm trying to get the brethren back in the habit of what saith the scriptures? What does the Word of God say? That you're trying to compare what they're saying, whether it's in a book or whether it's on a camera, like I am right here, what I'm talking to you about. Make sure you have your King James Bibles and you're making sure and you're doing your own studies and research. So, to find out, like the brands, they check the scriptures night and day to see if those things were so. So, we're going to be in the next set of stanzas. We did the first set. And there's four sets of stanzas in this poem. So the second set of stanzas we read, My spouses were many. My children brought grief to me and my people, for one life was brief. For purpose deceptive I drew, doodled and drooled. Men thought me a traitor, but I kept them fooled. Right. If you don't understand what Bible manhood is, is there's these poems in this book that say, okay, you got to read the poem, and then you got to figure out who, what Bible character is it talking about. So when they do that, we got, we're going to go through the scriptures and say, okay, is this actually in the Bible? So if you haven't figured it out from last study, from part one of these, this, uh, the, success, the successful failure, part one of successful failure, it's King David who we're talking about. So are they telling the absolute truth about King David, or are they bending it a little bit? You know, so that's the whole point. This is a great exercise. So we're going to go through that. Make sure you have your King James Bibles out. Make sure you're following along. And I pray, brethren, that when I first put this poem out, that the brethren took time to go through and look up the stuff for themselves and say, okay, where can I find it? And it also teaches you to look things up in the Bible. Okay? Instead of just trusting the man behind the camera, he'll do all the work for me. Brothers and sisters Christ, you're going to have to do the work for yourselves. I might not be on YouTube or on camera. The internet might get shut down and a new internet comes up and Bible believers won't be allowed on it. You know, God could at any time could take any of us home. And if you're relying on me and God takes me home, okay, Philip, Brother Philip Newton, it's your time. And I go home, you got to know how to do this stuff for yourselves. By, uh, word studies, subject studies, expository studies, how to look things up. Okay, make sure you have a Bible concordance. Okay, Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Um, that's the whole point of these studies, is to really motivate you, brothers and sisters in Christ, to really, really get into the Scriptures for yourself. So the first thing about successful failure, part two, is my spouses were many. Verse six. Now, some of you can say, well, that could be Solomon. That could be this person. <laughs> you know, they had Solomon, what, 700, 300 wives and 700 concubines? thousand wives. Uh, it could be Solomon, but when you read through the first part, please go watch the first part, you'll see that, oh, it's talking about King David. So we know it's talking about King David. So turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Now these were the sons of David, which were born unto him in Hebron. The firstborn Amnon and Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, the second Daniel of Abigail. So there's one of his wives, Abigail, the Carmelitess. Okay, we'll talk about her a little bit. The third, Absalom, the son of Micaiah, the daughter of Talma, king of Geshur. The fourth, Ajaniah, the son of Hag Haggith. There's another wife. The fifth, Shephaniah of Ab Abitel. The sixth, um, Ithrim, the Igla, by Igla his wife, the six were born unto him in Hebron, and there he reigned seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty years and three months, and was there, and these were born unto him in Jerusalem, Shimea, and Shobab, and Nathan, and Solomon, four of Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel, and I know I'm probably messing up these words, I'm bad with words, Ibhar also, and Elish, El, Elishama and Eliphet and no, Nagog and Nephig, I'm probably, like I said, just probably butchering this, Japhia and Elish, Elishama and 
Elidah, Elidad, da, and Eliphilet, that's this, yeah, nine. And these were all sons of David, besides the sons of the concubines and Tamar, their sister. Okay? He had a lot of wives. So was this saved true? My spouses were many. Did King David have more than one wife? Yes. Did he have a few? Yes. So would this be right? Yes. Uh, let's talk about Abigail. First Samuel 25. When you learn about Abigail, you have Abigail and Nabal. And King David's out there with his men. He's keeping Nabal's interests safe. You know, the, the sheep and the herdmen and everything. And when David and his men need something to eat, they write a letter to Nabal saying, Hey, we've done, we really haven't asked for anything. And we've been taking care of you and making sure that you're... She, he's a rich man, and you got your sheep say, we could use some food. Could we have some food? All right. And he sends a letter back telling them to get lost. Get lost. But he doesn't just say, I'm sorry, I don't have food to spare. It's not one of those letters. It's a letter of, who are you? You're nothing. Get lost. I mean, it's very disrespectful. So he's going to destroy Nabal and his house. And... Um, so then uh, Abigail, I'm just summarizing, Abigail comes forward and brings all this food to him before he gets a chance to destroy Nabal and all his house. And she just apologizes for Nabal and she's humbling herself. True humbleness. Humbling him, herself. Okay. So then we read in Abigail, 1 Samuel 25, but how does this have to do with Abigail being brought, uh, King David's wife? 1 Samuel 25. 1 through 44 is where you read the story about Abigail and, Na and Nabal. So if you want to pause this and read it, I, I, I would suggest pause it for a second and read 1 Samuel 25, 1 through 44. It's a long story. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that he hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and hath kept his servant from evil. In other words, God avenged him on him. King David was going to go do it himself, but God stopped him through Abigail. And God took care of Nabal, okay? That's how God does things. Brother and sister Christ, when it comes to enemies in the ministry, when it comes to the attacks from the lost world, when it comes to, you know, how the lost world treats you and everything, the Bible talks about heaping coals of fire on their head. You do good to them. You be nice, okay? God will deal with them, okay? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. God will deal with them, all right? And that's what we're learning here with King David. God dealt with him, and David's like, I didn't have to do anything. God took care of it. I should just trust the Lord. Amen. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to, to him to wife. And that's how he got Abigail as a wife. Amen. So that's where we get Abigail. Um, Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly... Beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. That's Romans 12, 19. And then 2 Samuel 5, 13, it says, And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron, and there was yet sons and daughters born to David. He had a lot of wives and concubines. Okay, so when it says there, My spouses were many, it could still be Solomon too. It could still have been them. That's why you got to compare everything that was in the poem. And like I said, with our first part, we already knew, okay, is this King David? Okay. So when it said, my spouses were many, did King David have many spouses? Yes, he did. He had many wives and concubines. The next part it says, and here's a big one. My children brought grief to me and my people. Who is that talking about? Well, we know about King David and his children. And as we get into this, brothers and sisters of Christ, uh, when we read 1 Chronicles chapter 3, if you want to pause and read it again, chapter 3, 1 through 8, and I butchered a lot of names, please forgive me. You, the sons that we're going to be talking about is Amnon, Absalom, Adonijah, and Tamar, the sister. They're children, okay? My children brought grief to me and my people. We're going to talk about those stories and what we can learn from them. But, brethren... Like I said, you're gonna. There's some brethren out there that they have children that are a grief. They're a grief. Okay, you're a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman out there, sister in Christ, brother in Christ, and you're gonna have children that when they grow up, even if you raise them in the admonition of the Lord, they're gonna go. They might still end up going the way of the world, and they're gonna be a grief to yours. 
Okay, because people are going to be like, you're a Bible-believing Christian? Isn't that your son out there doing such and such? Isn't that your daughter out there dressing such and such way? And so on and so It's like, it can be a grief. Children can be a grief. And we pray for our children, and it's not a good thing. In the sense that we don't just write them off in a heartbeat. It still hurts us. I mean, King David, I don't have this in my notes, but King David's talking about Absalom. Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom. He loved his son. But his son did wrong. I mean, what his son did was horrifying and sinful and wicked. It was wrong. But it was a grief to King David, and David still loved his children. How do you think that reflects to us today as Christians? God loves us. So when we go astray or we fall apart, God, God will pick us back up and put us back together. He still loves us. Okay. That, that's in type. But you read that, that's the, who we're going to talk about. So let's start with Amnon. What did Amnon do that brought grief to King David? Turn to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 9. Leviticus 18, verse 9. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. Okay, and the Old Testament, before the flood, and then before Noah, or Moses, I'm sorry, Noah went through the flood. Moses, is when Moses put out this law from God, it's not Moses putting it out, it's God's law. In the Old Testament, the bodies were in better health, better shape. There was people that could meet, could marry their half-sisters. But when Moses came out, and God with the law, the flood had already happened, so many years had come after the flood, and the bodies deteriorating, everything, all things deteriorate over time. All things deteriorate over time. Our DNA is getting worse and worse. Okay, we're having more prob physical problems today than we did in the past. Some of it has to do with our environment, yes, but some of it, I believe, has to do with just the fact that all things deteriorate over time. And one of the changes that were made was Moses came out and said, now it's not okay for you to marry your half-sister. Okay? Or your sister, half sister, okay? Um, so what happened? What did Amnon do? <laughs> Second Samuel chapter thirteen, verse one. If you want to turn to Second Samuel chapter thirteen, verse one. And it came to pass after this that Absalom the son of David had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. Well, it's against the law. Verse 3, But Amnon had a friend who was, whose name was jo John Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. You're going to come across those. He thinks he can find a way around the law. I can find a way around doing things God's way. I understand we have liberty today. We're not held accountable to the laws of God as far as the um, old Levitical laws, uh, holy days, Sabbath days, uh, new moon, ordinances, touch not, taste not. It's in the Bible. I, I, I heard a brother say, where's it at in the Bible? Uh, why don't you try reading the Old Testament? It's in the Bible. You're not allowed to touch undead. If you touch the undead, uh, dead, I'm sorry, a dead corpse, you're unclean. If you touch one of the animals that were deemed unclean, you're unclean. If you taste that animal, you're unclean. You eat from the meat of that animal, you're unclean. I mean, there's rules and laws in the Old Testament talking about touch, touch not, taste not, eat not. It's there. Okay? But you always have people today, when the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil, you always have people today that are very subtle, and they'll try to find ways around it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Oh, that book, it's not, this, this King James Bible, the Bible version issue, it's not that big of a deal, and they'll try to be subtle. Oh, eternal security, it's not that big of a deal, and they try to be subtle. Dispensational teaching, eh, it's not that big of a deal, and they try to be subtle. They try to find a way around it. Um, Pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. Oh, whether you believe that, or post or mid to, oh, and they try to be subtle, it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal. They try to be subtle, and try to find a way around it. Okay. Today, you know, the big fight going on right now is holidays. What do they do? They try to be subtle. 
They try to go around God's word. They try to change it into a lie. Okay? You got to be careful. I've slipped up sometimes and I said, I said one word and then I go through and start teaching another word. And I've had brethren correct me saying, hey, uh, you kind of replaced that word, didn't you? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess I kind of did. Lord, please forgive me. And I have to redo the study. Okay? So, brothers and sisters of Christ, you're always going to come across subtle men that are always going to try to find their way around God's commands. And they're very subtle about it. It's not that they're just straightforward. I'm, my, what I'm trying to get you to do is to go around God's commands. They're not doing that. They're being subtle. Remember we just read Leviticus 18.9. That's a command of God. Okay. Amnon is not allowed to have Tamar as a wife. Okay. He's not even allowed to see her nakedness. It's a sin. And here comes a man who's subtle, and he said, verse 4, And he said unto him, Why art thou being a king's son? I know that, that that's in the law, but come on, you're a king's son. Does that law really mean that much, or does it really apply to you? You know, something along those lines. Lean from day to day, wilt thou not then tell me? And Ammon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother, Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on the bed, and make thyself sick, and when thy father cometh to, when thy father cometh to, see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, and I may see it, and eat it at her hand. And he does. He puts on a big show, gets her to come in there, and then, I'm sorry, there's no other way to say it, then he rapes his sister, forces her sister. Second Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, and on 14. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. And here's key, this is what we got to learn from this. A, rape is wrong, absolutely. But sexual perversion, because that's what's going on here now. The law said you're not allowed to marry your sister. You're not allowed to see her nakedness. But verse 15 says that Amnon hated her exceedingly so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. Brothers and sisters of Christ, uh, Brother in Christ has an audio study. I put it on my channel too. Um, it's called The Porn Epidemic. I'm telling you right now, if you're young and newly saved, you need to stay away from porn. It's everywhere. Video games, Hollywood movies, TV shows, entertainment, advertisement, government. I mean, it's everywhere. Okay? You see sexual perversion all over the place. You need to stay away from it. Why? Because what did we just see here? It will change how you look at the opposite sex. Okay? God has set, because someone's asked me this before, okay, what's sexual perversion? And the easiest way to take it down to its most simplest form is God has sex set up under two boundaries. You ready for those two boundaries? The boundaries of marriage. Outside of marriage, sexual perversion. Okay? Marriage and to procreate. It has to meet those two guidelines for it to be a good thing. It's your husband, it's your wife, and you're gonna have, you do it in a way that you can have children. Okay, anything else is sexual perversion. What Amnon did there was sexual perversion. Okay, and look how it, it changed him. How he looked at Tamar. Brothers and sisters of Christ, you get your head so messed up with that filth and that junk it's going to affect how you look at the opposite sex, how you treat the opposite sex. Right? If you're in that stuff and you're newly saved, God will get you out of it quick. Okay, God will get you out of it. It's wrong. Stay away from it. It will affect your relationship with the opposite sex, just like we saw here. But you want to talk about a grief of mine to, for, to King David when King David found out and the reason I'm not reading any further is because when we get to Absalom, Absalom decides to take it into his own hands to deal with Amnon and what he did. 
that was also a grief to King David. Okay? But you have your children misbehaving and something so wicked and vile is what Amnon did, raping his own sister. So let's get into Absalom. Remember, things that were written before time are written for our learning. We can learn from their mistakes, okay? We need to keep sex in the confines that God puts it, in the boundaries that God puts it in, in marriage, and it's done in a way that has to do with procreating and having children. And that's where it stops, okay? There's nothing else. Well, what about this? No trying to be guile and trying to be, um, what are we reading here? Subtle. No subtleties. No trying to find ways around God's word. That's it and final. Keep your head clean and your heart pure. That's why the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. It'll start messing you up. It'll mess up how you look at things. It'll mess up how you treat people. It'll really mess you up. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Turn to 2 well, Samuel chapter 13, verse 22. Jump down to verse 22. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon, because he had forced his sister Tamar. And it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shears in Balhazor, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons, and Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, now thy servant hath sheep shears. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with thy servant. And the king said, said to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all go down. Now go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him, howbeit he would not go, but blessed him. Then said Absalom, If not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, Why should he go with thee? But Absalom pressed him that he let Amnon and all the king's son go with him. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, didn't even bother him what he did, then kill him, fear not, have not I commanded you, be courageous and be v valiant. Okay, so Absalom, make sure I get the names right, had Amnon killed. Now remember what we read up there about how vengeance is mine, saith the Lord? King David didn't have to kill um, Abs, I guess I it right, Amnon. God took care of him. God took care of him. Should King, now that's a whole other discussion. Should have King David done something? That's a whole other Bible discussion. But once again, God took care of him. So, Jump down to 38, we read, So Absalom fled and went to Geshar and was there three years. He was on the run from his father, King David. He had just killed, even though Amnon, some of us would say Amnon got what he deserved, it took Ab Absalom being subtle, using trickery, being deceitful, and murdering his brother. Okay. And he was fleeing, and he's on the run. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 4. It says, Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land. Now we're going back to Absalom. Remember, we're talking about Absalom here. So Amnon totally was a grief to his father. Absolutely. What he did, wicked, vile. It was a grief to his father. So was that true, that he had children that were a grief to his? Um, yeah. Absalom, now we're going to get to Absalom. What is Absalom going to do? He's going to try to turn the people against King David. He's going to take his place and try to set himself up as king. He's going to sleep, and you know what I mean by sleep, with his concubines that are left behind. I mean, it's very wicked what he does. Second Samuel 15.4, uh, uh, Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come to, him to me, and I would do him justice. He's telling people, King David's too busy. He's sitting at the gates where the judgment's supposed to happen. People are coming to get judgment from King David, and he's like, He's not, he's too busy. Oh, if I were made judge, then you'd have real justice. And on this matter did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Very slick, very sly. In 2 Samuel 15, 14, we read, And David said unto all his servants that were with him in Jerusalem, Rise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. 
Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. Now, like I said, there's a lot more to this story, but we'd be talking about it for hours and hours and hours. Read the whole story about what's going on. Okay? Absalom tries to take over, and it's one of the punishments, and we'll get into that in one of these sections about the punishments that brought, uh, King David did some wrong, made some mistakes, and God spared his life, but there were still consequences for his actions. There were still punishments that God was giving him, and this was one of them. Okay, God could have prevented this, but he's like, this is one of your punishments to humble King David. Okay. It's one of your punishments. So you read that whole story. Absalom puts himself up. They go to fight. He tells people, don't kill Absalom. They kill Absalom. And he's, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Because he loves his son. But it's hard. The hardest thing you're going to see, especially in the Bible, is it's so easy for me to look at someone else's son and say, what you're doing is wrong. What you're letting your son do is wrong. And you're supposed to do something about it. It, it seems to be harder when, it's, when it hits closer to home. It's a lot harder to deal with it when it's closer to home. We saw that with Eli and his kids. Okay, Eli got had to suffer punishment because he didn't keep his kids in line. Okay, you go read about Eli. The next son we're going to talk about is Adonijah. If I can say it right, Adonijah. It's kind of hard. Adonijah. First Kings one eight. What does this son do? That's a grief to his father. But Zodak the priest, and Benaniah the son of Jehoadad, and Nathan the prophet, and Simeon, and Ray, and the mighty men which belonged to David, were not with Adoniah. And Adoniah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Sohelath, which is by Enrogel, and called on his brethren, the king's son, and all the men of Judea, the king's servant. But Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah, and the mighty men, and Solomon his brother, he called not. Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, and the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adoniah the son of Hagag doth reign? He just set himself up as king. And David our Lord knoweth it not. Now therefore come, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel, that thou mayst save thine own life and the life of son Solomon. It was a serious thing. He would set himself up king, and then he'd have to kill anybody that's involved with who truly was supposed to be king. Because King David, if you read the story, she goes into Bathsheba, didn't you say that Solomon would reign in your stead? So if this other guy sets up his rule, I'm going to be king, King David's on his deathbed, he dies, He's got to take care of anybody else that would challenge his authority. That'd be Bathsheba, the king's wife, and Solomon, who was supposed to reign. And you read the whole story about it, okay? So Solomon rides on the uh, king's donkey, and they all proclaim him the king, and the king himself proclaims, and he's not dead yet, but says, hey, Solomon's going to rule. He's going to rule as a king now. I'm passing the kingship onto him. And you read all about that. Was that a big hassle? Especially if you're on your deathbed and, and you just want to die in peace. And then here you go. We got sons fighting over the, the, the king again. After what, Adjana, Adjana, say, Absalom, after what Absalom did, now he's got another son fighting for the throne. It's like, did he have sons that um, brought grief to him and to the people? I mean, if... One thing we didn't mention with Absalom is he, he started a war against the Jews against the Jews. His own people. Yeah. Adjanijah, he was trying to turn people against each other. The Jews getting a fight going on among the Jews. Verse 8. For one life was brief. So was that true? Did, he have, did King David have sons that had problems? And those problems were known, and it was a grief to King David. Absolutely. That was in the Bible. For the next stanza says, For one life was brief. For one life was brief. If you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because 
by this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemy of the Lord to blaspheme the children, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah, Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. Now stop there for a second. How many of you guys, how many brothers and sisters Christ remember the story of Eli? His sons are doing very wicked things. They're eating flesh with the blood they're in, and they're fornicating with the women at the front of the tent. Of the synagogue, I won't say it's not, but in the tents, in front of the tents. In other words, it's a place where harlots would stand. Okay, They were doing some very wicked things. And when Eli was told his punishment, his punishment, this is what's going to happen, this is what God's going to do, what was Eli's response? Oh, let the Lord do what seemeth good in his own eyes. And he didn't do anything. Well, oh well. Well, oh well. What do we see King David doing here? David therefore besought God for the child. Lord, please forgive me. I was wrong. What I did was wrong, Lord. I was 100% wrong. Please forgive me. And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. Repentance. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. Now, some people would have been like, getting mad at God. I was repenting. Why didn't you save the child? I was fasting. I was, I was, why? Why? Let's see what King David's response is. On the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How, he, how will he... Then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead. And you keep reading. I forgot to put this in here, but you keep reading. He gets up and he goes in, cleans himself off, and he goes and praises the Lord. He goes in and starts worshiping the Lord. He doesn't get mad at him. He doesn't have hate for what God did. I deserve that. I was praying. And when the, the, his servants ask him, what is this that you are doing? And he's like, who knows the mercies of the Lord? While the child that lived, God might have forgiven me and had a change of mind. And when God repents, it's a change of mind. When man repents, it's a change of heart. Okay? God doesn't sin, but God can change his mind and say, you know, and he did on a lot of things in the Bible. Where he started, especially with King David, one of his punishments, which we'll get to, you know, he says, stop, that is enough. Stop, that's enough. When the angel of the Lord is destroying the city. Stop. That's enough. Okay. Who knows the mercies of God? But now that the child's dead, there's nothing I can do but praise the Lord. How many of you have that attitude, brother and sister Christ? Bad things are happening in your life, and you know it's your fault, and you deserve it. And you're praying, and I do too. Pray, Lord, please uh, forgive me. Take this from me. Forgive me. Forgive me. But if the Lord says, hey, you need to go through some things, you still need to be go through some chastisement. You know, the scars of sin. Okay, sins can be forgiven by God, but there's still scars. There's still consequences here on earth while you're living on earth sometimes when there's sin. Okay, you drink a lot and you get drunk a lot and you get saved and you've got liver cancer or something like that. It doesn't just disappear. There's still some consequences, physical consequences to those sins. And uh, someone brought it up once that he had to live with the scars. Sometimes we live with the scars of our sins. Okay. Yeah. He's like, how many of you brothers says Christ are like King David? He's like, okay, I had to go through that. I had to go through that punishment or the bad time or that hard time and I give God glory. And you give God glory and you praise the Lord. How many of you do that? For the study, check the scriptures. It said, for one life was brief. Is that true? For one life was brief. One of his sons, the life was very brief. Yeah. Died really shortly after he was born. Okay. 
And like I said, there's another set of stanzas in here that talk about how three times God punished me. And it's like, we'll get into the punishment, why this happened. But right now, did this happen? Yes. The next stanza says, For purpose deceptive I drool, I doodled and drooled. How many of you knew what this one was? How many of you look back and say, Oh, I remember that story. I remember when he was faking himself to be a madman. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 10. Isn't this David, the guy that's killed a lot of us? This is the Philistines. Isn't this this David, this mighty warrior that's killed tons of us? We need to kill him, you know. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 10. And David arose and fled the day to, that day to, for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad in their hands, and scrabbled on the door of the gate, and let his spittle fall down his, upon his beard. Just comes down like a madman. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see, this, the mad, this man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him unto me? Have I need of madmen, that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? He deceived him and saved his life. So when you read that, for purpose, deceptive, I drooled, doodled and drooled, I, I, I would, in the comment section, how many of you, when you read that, you're like, I remember that story where King David feigned himself to be a madman to save his life. I did. Uh, when I was newly saved, I wouldn't have. But the Lord's put me through the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, so many times. I'm starting to go, wait a minute, I remember that. Yes, I remember that. And then sometimes I don't remember it in great detail, which is why you go back and reread these stories over and over. So you keep the stories fresh in your heart. Okay. Last part for the study. Men thought me a traitor, but I kept them fooled. Men thought me a traitor, but I kept them fooled. 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 7. And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year. 1 Samuel 27, 7. And four months. And David and his men went up and invaded the Geshurites and the Jezerites and the Amalekites. For those nations were of old the inhabitants of the land, as thou goest to Shur, even unto the land of Egypt. And David smote the land, and left neither man nor woman alive, and took away the sheep, and the oxen, and the asses, and the camels, and the apparel, and returned, and came to Achish. Now when I first read this, men thought me a traitor, but I kept them full. I was kind of a little confused, and I had to read this story again to get, you know, you, you you get the scriptures, hide them in your heart. Sometimes we forget things. What does it mean that they thought me a traitor? Verse 11, And David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring tidings to Gath, saying, lest they should tell on us, saying, So did David, and so will be his manner all the while he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. And Agish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utter to abhor him, therefore he shall be my servant forever. What's going on here? He's destroying Philistines and land that's promised land to the uh, Jewish people. And he's coming back with these spoils and he's acting like he, he was attacking the Jewish people. And he got this spoil from the Jewish people. And then you see him. And Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. He wasn't attacking Israel. Do you see what I'm saying? Men thought me a traitor, but I kept them fooled. He fooled King Agag. I'm sorry, Achish. And Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. So where is this line coming from? They're getting it from that story. So was that in the Bible? Did King David try to fool the Philistines into believing that he had turned against the Jewish people so he could stay there peacefully? Yeah. Did he actually turn against his people, the Jewish people? No. Okay. So, 
Once again, we read something or someone says something, we check the scriptures daily to see if those things are so. So this is part two of a successful failure. Hopefully you followed along with me. Okay? Remember, things that are written before time are written for our learning. We can learn from the mistakes that people have made in the Old Testament, regardless where it's at. Okay, so be careful. I do agree with that statement. Please understand. I agree with the statement. Not all the Bible is written to us. Okay? There's going to be things in the Old Testament. It's not written to Christians today. I understand that. But don't forget, brothers and sisters of Christ, that things that were written for for time are written for our learning. We can learn from it. We can learn from the mistakes of people. That get, they get power hungry and they want to be in charge and they want to be in control and they don't care who they've got to kill or who they got to stab in the back to get it. You got sons of King David where they're getting very fleshly and going after the flesh and destroying themselves. Okay. We can learn from the Old Testament. All The whole Bible is not written to me, but the whole Bible is written for me. Things that were written before time is written for our learning. So when you're reading these stories, Brother Sister Christ, and you're looking up, like when we're doing these poems, and you're looking stuff up, take some time to read the stories and learn something from it. Get some instruction and righteousness out of it. Okay? So... The sun came out today finally. We had rain, rain, rain. It got very cold in here. <laughs> and it's starting to get too warm to wear my hat. But I thank the brethren for their prayers. And please, please, what you get out of this, brothers and sisters of Christ, is that this is our final authority. Not this. Okay? Not the man behind the camera. Not the hirelings out there. Not the wolves in sheep's clothing. Not the traditions culture. The traditions of men. That's what culture is. It's just another way of saying the traditions of men. That's not the final authority. This is the final authority. Okay? That's what this exercise is for. And I pray that you, brethren, that have been following along, that you were actually looking up some of those things. Because sometimes I see something that's like, I don't remember that. It, that might be a lie. I don't remember it. And then you look in the Bible and it's like, oh yeah, that is there. I just didn't remember it. And there's some times where you read something like, I know exactly what they're talking about there. I'm going to go here. And when you listen to someone online, they're going through the scriptures like, I think I know where he's going to go next. Oh, he went to that scripture next. You know, it's that heartfelt thing. The, so, the Holy Spirit in us and fellowship and the love of God's word. Because you're staying in it and you're reading it. And it's not just up here, but you need to start applying it down here. That's why the Bible says, Thy word and thy heart have I... It says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. Okay. We hide God's word in our heart. There's things we can learn from in the Old Testament. Please heed my warning, especially with Amnon. Please heed my warning. Stay away from filth. Perversion, the nature of perversion is it always gets worse. Always. Okay, stay away from wickedness, stay away from sin, stay away from filth, abstain from all appearance of evil, put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Don't give in to temptation. God is faithful who will not have you be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation provide a way to escape. Turn to God, get his word heart in your heart. Memorize some scriptures and hide them in your heart. Memorize some hymns, hide them in your heart. Okay. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'll see you in the next series of this studies. And we're going to be talking about King David's mistakes because that was in the poem. So I'll see you in the next studies.